this year, nations all over the world are feeling the effects of a global food shortage, which has driven the price of basic crops like corn, rice, and wheat to an all-time high. So how did this happen? An unfortunate act of nature? Not hardly. The UN World Food Program calls it a silent tsunami that's threatening millions of people on every continent. It's hunger. The price of food staples like rice, wheat, and corn are suddenly going through the roof because there aren't enough crops to go around. Economists fear this new global food shortage will get worse before it gets better and could result in massive malnutrition all over the world. This is something that knows no borders and that is rolling through the world and really increasing the misery index of the world's most vulnerable. Now here in the United States, we're just beginning to feel the pain of high food prices. But in low-income countries where 50 to 80 percent of a family's income is spent on food, the shortage is already having a devastating impact. In order to help those nations, President Bush has called for another $770 million in emergency foreign food assistance. But how did the food shortage become so acute so fast? The growing consensus is that the crop deficit is directly related to the increased demand for production of, quote, earth-friendly biofuels, an effort pushed by none other than the vanquished Vice President Al Gore, and all in the name of, quote, saving the planet. Now this is how it works. Global warming alarmists preach that filling our cars with biofuels, like ethanol, that that's the answer to protecting the environment. Then larger portions of food crops are set aside for fuel production, which cuts into the amount of corn, rice, and wheat that make it to families all over the world. In the end, less available food causes skyrocketing prices, and it's low-income families that are hurt the most. Al Gore himself took credit for the increase in ethanol production in a speech that he delivered to the third annual farm conference back in 1998. I was also proud to stand up for the ethanol tax exemption when it was under attack in Congress, at one point supplying a tie-breaking vote in the Senate to save it. The more we can make this homegrown fuel a successful, widely used product, the better off our farmers and our environment will be. But a recent study by two professors at the University of Minnesota who specialize in economics and food policy says misguided policies like that one are to blame for the food shortage that we're all feeling now. With all its attention biofuels is getting, it's supplying about 3% of the transportation food fuel needs of the United States. If we use the entire corn crop, they'd leave any of it to feed livestock or to export. We could supply about 18% of our transportation fuel needs. So in that sense of the word, ethanol in and of itself is not the answer. The connection between biofuel and the food shortage is so clear that last week, 24 Republican senators sent a letter to the Environmental Protection Agency suggesting a change to the current mandate on ethanol production. So if you work out the math and, and you're going to fill up a 25-gallon tank of a big luxury car and SUV with pure 100% ethanol, that's going to take about 450 bushels of corn. That corn contains enough calories, something on the order of about 2,000 calories a day, to feed a person for a year. But the fact is, Al Gore has a financial stake in spreading global warming hysteria. He's admitted to investing in the kinds of companies that will profit from his plea to, quote, go green. Was Al Gore thinking about saving the planet or perhaps lining his pockets? So here we have Professor Gore making the rounds to college campuses with his inconvenient documentary, convincing impressionable kids that the U.S. is a country full of irresponsible gluttons with giant carbon footprints. He urged the world to conserve energy, turn to biofuels like ethanol, and cut down on air travel. By the way, did he mention his mode of transportation? No, his private jet usage never came up. Of course, Al Gore's friends in the liberal media jumped on the global warming bandwagon, sounding the alarm on rising sea levels, melting glaciers, and the demise of the polar bear. But they continue to ignore the fact that scores of scientists all over the world say human activities are not heating up the Earth at all. In fact, some studies indicate the Earth is poised to begin a period of global cooling. But the network news outlets, well, they never seem to report on that. So did Al Gore blatantly disregard climate information that didn't help his bottom line? Or was he just terribly wrong? Instead of making room on the mantle for his Academy Award, maybe Gore should have been looking a little bit harder at the impact 
of his short-sighted, quote, go green agenda. Now that the wheels are coming off of Al Gore's global warming bandwagon, well, even some of his loyal supporters may have to make a choice. Should I follow Al Gore's half-baked notion to save the planet or feed my family? The answer should be obvious.